Uh, my name is Chris Hansen. I'm part of the New Hampshire Peace Action That's Activity, so, and I'm proud to be. Uh, I'm happy to be here, especially as my longtime friend, Joan. Uh, I have a sign-up tablet here. If you would like to be on the New Hampshire Peace Action email list, and you are not already, please sign your name here with your email address. And I also have been involved with peace and justice work in Guatemala and the Guatemala Accompaniment Project, which is uh, one of our fundraising projects each year is to sell calendars. And these calendars are photographed by people who have done human rights work in Guatemala. These are $15 each. I would be very happy to take <coughs> your request, and I hope to have some to sell you in a few days. So I would also welcome you to approach me, or if you want to raise your hand now, and I, if I know your name, I'll put you down. But um, it's a very worthwhile effort. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Will Hopkins. I'm the uh, director of New Hampshire Peace Action. Um, got there uh, via uh, an 11 month tour in Iraq as an infantryman, um, which is uh, an interesting way to become a peace activist. Um, I took over at New Hampshire Peace Action a little over three years ago, uh, just after uh, the inauguration of Barack Obama. It's an interesting time to get involved with the peace movement because uh, we had our membership was at an all time high uh, just about six months before I took over. Uh, you know, Money was pouring in from foundations, from national funders, um, and uh, I took over, and membership has just kind of sailed down. Um, and uh, it's been uh, it, it's been an interesting time to try to try to keep a small nonprofit alive. Most uh, organizations like New Hampshire Peace Action around the country um, have either dried up and blown away, um, or have gone to part-time staff uh, or sporadic staff here or there. Um, knock on wood, thus far I have managed to keep the doors open. Um, I know many of you are members. We have a quick show of hands. Uh, how many people here got, uh, got a call from someone at New Hampshire Peace Action that this event was happening? A couple of you. All right, great. Um, how many people heard about it from Joan or through the church? The vast majority of you. <laughs> All right, well that explains the turnout. Uh, we only had two weeks to organize this event, so I'm and to see about 40 faces in the room is exciting for me, and uh, it's, it's uh, I, now I know how that happened. <laughs> um, really excited to, to introduce Joan. Um, Dr. Joan Roloffs is the author and co-author of, she's the, the author of three books, but the co-author of, of uh, somewhere, some, somewhere in the 20s, I think. I'm calling it Countless. Um, <laughs> uh, books and scholarly articles on imperialism, building green economies, uh, foundations influence on politics, the effects of philanthropy, judicial activism, and social movements for change. Uh, she's published regularly in Counterpunch and occasionally in Global Research, as well as several scholarly publications. Um, she has presented on women in political activism, green development, nonprofits, Marxism, corporate philanthropy, and its inverse. Um, she's been asked to present all over the US and as far away as Italy, Argentina, Canada, Germany, France, Spain, and Finland. She's the recipient uh, of the American Political Science Association's Distinguished Career Award and the Middlebury College Bicentennial Medal. Uh, she's a longtime leader in New Hampshire's peace movement and in the Monadnock Greens. Uh, I'm proud to introduce Joan. She's part of our, uh, we're doing an annual <coughs> series called An Amazing Woman for Peace. Um, where we're, we're trying to, from September to December of every year, New Hampshire Peace Action is sponsoring a woman speaker somewhere in the state um, to amplify the voices of women working for peace. Um, that's part of having a male director who's a veteran, and, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I certainly started out pretty, uh, pretty centered on, on that masculine energy, and it's really not the best thing for peace frequently. Um, and so I'm consciously trying to make sure we're, we're amplifying the voices of women. <laughs> um, very, very proud to, to uh, introduce Dr. Joan Roloffs. Thank you. Well, you, you're going to have to work too, because I hope you don't expect me to solve all the problems of the world. I'm going to ask you for a lot of help, because I will speak for a while, but then I hope there's going to be a lot of discussion afterwards. 
One reason I want to talk about the silence regarding war and militarism is because people say, why talk about it? There's nothing we can do about it. But I believe that talking about it is something to do about it. If more people are concerned and outraged, a social movement can develop. <coughs> if our representatives in Congress hear that we are concerned about this issue of war, they wish to be reelected, they will pay some attention to us. I, I will first describe the situation that I found outrageous, and then I want to explore some of the reasons for the silence. And my observations are going to fall under four headings, propaganda, fear, distractions, and interests. Then I want to hear your views about why there is so much acceptance and so little protest against our government's illegal and immoral foreign policy. And I'm especially interested in the silence among the good people, progressives, liberals, religious people, environmentalists, civil liberties advocates, students, academics, intellectual types, you would expect to be outraged. Psychologist Andrew Levine suggests that defeatism and feelings of powerlessness have quieted many citizens. But this should not apply to people who are generally outspoken, confident, and politically active. And that is the silence that most concerns me right now. Some of the outrageous developments that I think should be addressed and certainly protested against is, of course, the wars of choice and the destruction of nations, their political systems, their people, and the devastation of their environments. To mention only a few recent ones, Yugoslavia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. There is also the assassination <laughs> policy, drone warfare, detention, rendition, and torture covert actions through violence or subversion have overthrown governments and manipulated the politics of many nations, including our allies. Our treaty commitments under the UN Charter, which outlaw war, and any aggression or threat of it against other nations have been grossly violated. So even the threat of war is illegal. The UN Security Council, which is supposed to provide the peaceful resolution of disputes, is itself being destroyed. And of course, our own troops are being killed and wounded in body and mind. Beyond that, there's another development which is barely noticed. And this is the militarization of the entire world and outer space by our government. This is, of course, un-American according to the principles of our nation's founding, which were supposedly against kings and imperialism and war <coughs> and standing armies. Remember those documents, yes. Uh, and of course, we can hardly promote democracy in an atmosphere where we are militarizing the whole world. And to top all of these things off, there's something else. And nothing can beat this, which is that there is a threat to all life on this planet. I want to look at a few of the elements of this colossus that we are creating in the whole entire world. And one layer is the network of military bases. There are close to a thousand, depending how you count them, that the US maintains worldwide. This is a foreign military occupation that confers power over the politics and society of the host countries. They make the people of those areas vulnerable as targets. They are toxic to the environment and humans. Even our own troops have complained about the toxins on military bases. They, produce, they may produce constant noise from overflights, artillery fire, and bombing practice and they tend to generate a prostitution industry. 
criminal jurisdiction is removed from the host country. Okinawa is known for strong protests against U.S. bases, but there are other places where people are furious, such as Vicenza, Italy, which is a UNESCO heritage city. There's already one large base there, and they are building a second one, despite the noble protests of people, which, of course, you don't hear about very much. Ally or foe, when we liberate a country, we stay, creating a permanent occupation. Another layer of this colossus is the network of foreign military training. Training of foreign troops and even of foreign <coughs> political leaders occurs not only at the notorious School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia, but at more than 200 institutions in the United States. Some of these are military entities, and some are public and private universities and colleges. This weekend happens to be the annual protest at Fort Benning of the School of the Americas. <coughs> and I, I don't know whether the New York Times has said anything about that. This, it, what, there was a time when they actually published articles about it before and after, but I'm not, I haven't had a chance to <coughs> But this is a, a very important annual protest against just one of the military institutions that train foreign troops. And it is the people who went to that school who murdered the nuns in El Salvador, who murdered Archbishop Romero, and who were part of the overthrow group in Honduras recently. And many other, many, many other assassinations and terrorism from the, the graduates of that school. By the way, I forgot to mention that I have a handout here for anyone who wants more information on these things or citations for what I'm saying, in case you don't believe me. There's a lot of uh, information. You can pick this up later. This one sheet <coughs> of stuff, because I can't give you all the references now. <laughs> Um, the, this foreign military training occur, occurs worldwide, not only in the United States, but all over the world. We have institutions where we're training foreign troops. The State Department reports that in 2010, approximately 67,000 <coughs> students from 159 countries participated in military military training by the U.S. military. Furthermore, all armament sales from this country are accompanied by military training. And last year, the United States sold $66 billion worth of armaments to the whole world, which is more than three quarters of the global arms market from the United States. The U.S. Special Operations Forces also train with their counterparts in about 75 countries. It, and they engage in violent, nonviolent, and even humanitarian activities. The third overlapping layer is the expansion of NATO into a worldwide military monster. Aside from its wars of aggression, NATO membership requires countries that are members to spend a certain percentage of their national budget on armaments, to have the latest high-tech military equipment, and to have a free market economy in order to be part of NATO. So NATO works hand in hand with international financial institutions and international capitalism. And NATO has penetrated very deeply into the European Union. And it's a very closely related institution. NATO is no longer a defensive Atlantic alliance. It has 28 full members, 22 partner countries. And that includes Sweden, Switzerland, and Russia, and 19 other affiliates, such as Israel, New Zealand and Japan. 
NATO seems intent on becoming the government of the world, replacing the UN. Another thing is that the scope of US operations abroad blurs the distinction between military and civilian functions. Our troops are there in disasters as well as for routine social services. They even operate dental clinics in Africa and pet clinics in Central America. In order to tame the hostility to US militarism, they come in as kind, helpful friends. Where if they were coming in as military troops, they would be totally unwelcome but they get in this way. And all of these networks <coughs> produce power for the United States through clientele relationships. We help our trainees to become the military and political leaders of all the countries in the world, and we then have friends in high places who will cooperate in our projects, regardless of the wishes of the citizens. Honduras is a traditional banana republic, but Sweden is heading that way. And this is, this is one of the things that shocked me years ago when I started to find out all about this. That those countries that were historically considered the most democratic in the world, like Denmark and Sweden, because of the influence of NATO, have, have become very, very different because it is the NATO people, the, their, the equivalent of their departments of defense and the NATO attaches, who are deciding a lot of the policies of those countries. And there are times when even the prime ministers of those countries, if they're not of the right political party, don't even know what's going on. This is, this is really shocking. And there's very little of this information that comes through in the press here, but it is available. Also, of course, we should be shocked at the militarization of our own country. Again, this country was supposedly created to get away from kings and their empires and wars and standing armies. Yet we now have nearly <coughs> 5,000 military bases on our soil, over 100 in our territories. And we have a military economy of vast size and scope. We are also witnessing the blending of civilian and military functions, for example, the CIA and the Special Operations Forces, or the State Department and the Department of Defense in foreign <coughs> policy formulation and execution. And it's especially alarming that for our children, there are hundreds of killing games <coughs> free online, including <coughs> close combat, which was originally created to train Marines. Now it's popular with kids who get used to killing as normal and part of fun. Television and films are also full of violence. Our schools are heavily militarized. And that's especially in poor and minority <coughs> districts. There are six public high schools in Chicago that are military academies. And there's, in fact, one is a middle school that's a military academy. Chicago has the most of these public schools that are military academies. And, of course, the junior ROTC is everywhere. The Reserve Officers Training Corps is all over the country. And it's increasing. 